I've always loved flying since I was a kid. I used to ride my bike out to an abandoned airport in Alabama and just sit on the runway. And I got the feeling there that I thought you're supposed to get in church, but I didn't get it in church. I got it at the airport. I felt guilty about that, but I've always loved flying. I had bad eyes, so I couldn't go to the Air Force Academy like my best buddy in high school did. But then I got my eyes fixed. Odds and ends, taught high school, middle school, went to medical school, worked at the refugee camp in Southeast Asia, um, worked emergency rooms around for a while, got tired of that. Retired and just been flying, flying ever since. I've been flying with Lighthawk about 20 years, mainly in uh, Mexico, Central America. Hey, my name's Chuck, I fly for Lighthawk. It's the conservation flying group. We think there's no greater gift than this Earth. In a hundred billion star systems, there's not another place like this. And our greatest responsibility is to take care of it. And the greatest tragedy would be if we, if we lost it, if we destroyed it. And so Lighthawk's commitment is to offer aerial survey to any conservation group that, that needs it and we're happy to do it to support the great work of organizations like American Rivers and like Trout Unlimited, Sierra Club, and Nature Conservancy. November 346 Alpha, November, no cool 346 Romeo, November at the Jet Center with Alpha. VFR local flight departing to the north northwest. What I enjoy most in the flights is, is hearing the uh, conservation workers describe what we're seeing. You know me, I'm just trying to fly the airplane and not hit the mountains. But to, to, to hear the conservation workers who know the area so well and know what's going on in every location, to hear them explain their vision and what they've done and what they hope to do, that's really cool. And it makes it all worthwhile. The Upper Pooter watershed is really no stranger to fire. Historically, wildfire has happened, you know, on every, you know, 30 to 40 years, depending on the forest ecosystem. But as soon as Forest Service was established, they, they came up with the out by 10 a.m. policy. And so we became really, really good at managing and suppressing wildfire. There's just a different dynamic now with the fires that are burning in the Pooter and across the West. In the early 2000s, we saw several fires that burned kind of lower elevations. They were what we would now consider to be small fires. And then in 2012, we had the High Park Fire, which burned over 85,000 acres of the watershed. And earlier that summer, there was the Hewlett Gulch fires. So those fires combined, all of a sudden we had over 90,000 acres burned in the watershed. That kind of scale of fire is unprecedented and maybe it isn't unprecedented now maybe this is our new norm and it probably is with climate change and and just the the health of our forest is not great the greatest impacts of a wildfire really come after the flames are out and so we're we're anticipating that we're going to see these impacts for the next five to ten years the immediate impacts are directly to water quality and threats to life and safety So both the city of Fort Collins and city of Greeley take water directly off the Poudre River, right at the canyon mouth. They've had to shut off both of their intake structures for weeks at a time. One of our next steps too is our reforestation effort. So we have combined forces with the Nature Conservancy and a few other nonprofit groups here in uh, Fort Collins and the Front Range using the Nature Conservancy's climate model to specifically plant ponderosa pine trees at higher elevations than we would typically expect. This fall we're going to be planting the 10,000 and then next spring we're hoping to plant about 15,000. Really the long-term goals of this program is for it to last at least the next five to ten years and to continue to reforest these areas uh, that were burned in these fires over the last ten years. I'm a crew leader for the Larimer County Conservation Corps, and for the last week or so we've been planting ponderosa pines in the Cameron Peak burn scar for regrowth purposes because everything that has been regrowing here has been lodgepole pines, 
and we want more ponderosas that are more able to survive severe fires and more constant fires. It's, you know, it's, it is hard work, you do sweat a lot, and you feel it at the end of the day, but every day you get to look back and go, I did that, I planted all those trees, you know. In 20 or 30 years, I'm gonna be able to come back here and say oh, all these trees I helped plant. So it's one thing seeing the fire on a map. You know, I've seen all the maps. I know what the burn area looks like on the map. The perspective that a plane ride can give you is just very dramatic. The scale of the fire, something, you know, a different perspective that you can't really see from the road or just from walking through a burned area. Being able to work with all these different agencies, whether it be federal government, state government, nonprofit groups, really engaged community members, seeing how much they care and how much they want to help is, is what definitely what gives me hope. But being able to see the trees come back is very inspiring and, and definitely can give you hope after you've walked through you know, a burned moonscape. 300,000 people depend on this river, wildlife depend on it. I mean, it's, it truly is the lifeblood of our community and we all depend on it from agriculture, for recreation, for drinking water. So our river is, is what's at stake. Up on ground, station air 346, Romeo, November. We started in 2016 with the first Beaver Dam analogs in this spot. We built about half a dozen right here, and then we came back in and, and built a bunch more as the stream bed started to come up. Now you can't see any of them because the ones that are left after the flooding last year are buried, which is fine because it reshaped the valley bottom. Rather than being a deep, narrow, and sized channel, now it's a a meandering channel with some diversity in it and a connection to a floodplain. So a beaver dam analog is basically a man-made beaver dam. We come in and we put posts across the stream. We fill, we, we weave in native material into those posts here and those act really good as a sediment filter, allowing that water to slow down a little bit, drop the sediment out and then, and then keep going as cleaner water. My concept along with my family has been, if anything, we want to preserve this. We want to preserve it for not only ourselves, but for other people that value those types of things. Basically what we do is we have a cow-calf operation. The other major thing we've been doing beside the agricultural pursuits, we do uh, an agritourism business where we've now got a campground. We've um, got people that visit us camping, hiking, biking, um, just getting away from it all. And uh, they have really appreciated the restorative work that we've done on the stream, the trails that we've got, and um, just getting back to Mother Nature. And We've got a lot more work to do in this particular spot, but um, it's completely doable. I'd certainly like to see at least a mile a year. I think that's achievable, but it's gonna take uh, a little bit of extra capacity. So we've built plenty of partnerships. We have a lot of willing landowners like, like Leo. We've just gotta put the other pieces together. It's been spectacular, and I mean the amount of interest and involvement have been just greater than my wildest expectations. I want to see a creek running like it's supposed to. Now it still looks a little bit messy, which is fine, restoration is messy. So right here on the property, we reconnect a floodplain, we green it up, we, uh, we have a, a stream that's functioning and a water table that is connected and filling during the spring so all that water doesn't rush past us. We're not losing land because of sediment, we're actually gaining it because we're grading a stream bed. And this is trying to help rehab the entire landscape. The Colorado River, because of drought and, and bad hydrology and climate change, uh, we're seeing less and less flow, especially later and later in the season. These watershed projects higher in the watershed help keep water high and keep it flowing throughout the year help us to, to distribute that storage along the system so we can keep a, a healthy Colorado River watershed on a big scale. What is behind those feelings? You sound like my kids and you sound like my wife. They're like, you don't have to do this. And you know, they're right, I don't. But when you have people come up here 
and you watch how thrilled they are with what they're doing and building and creating and then have them come back again a year or two afterward and say, look, we just measured this. This is improved and this is improved. What we're talking about here is something a lot bigger than me, something a lot bigger than my family. And what it is, I want to go on forever. We are in the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. This river is really special for Arizona because it's one of the longest undammed rivers in the southwest. It provides an incredible, important habitat for over 400 species of neotropical migratory birds that come up from South America and Central America. As you move up towards the mountains, the aquifer itself is many thousands of feet deep. However, it's that top layer of the aquifer that um, allows the river to flow on the surface and provide enough water for that, this beautiful riparian habitat, this cottonwood white willow gallery forest. So it is somewhat of an oasis running through the desert. We have birders from all over the world that come down here to um, check out the birds they have never seen before. Is that of all the precipitation that falls on this basin, only 1% actually gets back into the aquifer. Another 1% runs off and then the other 98% evaporate. So we're in a position of trying to capture as much of that stormwater that would otherwise run out of the system and put it back into the ground. So the recharge basins that we saw in Palominas do just that. They capture stormwater that would otherwise run out of the system and try to get it to infiltrate into the alluvial aquifer, which is that groundwater most proximate to the river itself. So the city of Sierra Vista recharges approximately 2,700 acre feet of of uh, effluent a year back into the aquifer that helps to sustain the flow of the river. Some of the best places to put water back in the ground are these small tributaries that have sand and gravel in the bottom of them um, feeding the river. And if we can get water back into those tributaries, we think that we're gonna see the needle move on groundwater levels and alluvial aquifer levels. One of the things that impressed me was the impact of our monsoon season this year. To see all of the stock tanks and small ponds in the vicinity of the river having standing water in them. So that was really amazing to see from the air. It's also to see how sinuous the river is, how it really winds through the desert. It's not just a straight shot from the Mexican border north up to the Gila River. It's just a beautiful sight. You know, it's really nice to see that bird's eye perspective of what it is that we're working on on the ground level day to day. You know, we spend a lot of time in our offices chasing down grants and reviewing monitoring reports, but when we get back out on the ground or in the air to see you know, the resource that it is we're working for, it's really just a very different perspective. And having that aerial view of the river and its floodplains was really telling for me. I'm very hopeful that we'll be successful here, namely because of the partnerships that we've entered into. You know, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have imagined people getting together over a common resource like the San Pedro Riparian area. Yeah, Mark, the Nature Conservancy, man that we flew yesterday, he was like a kid in a candy store. The aerial perspective excited him no end, and he couldn't sit still in his seat, and he was pointing left and right about all the places he's been and the projects they were working on. He said we saved him hours and days of, of uh, driving around, seeing all the stuff that he could see in one big picture from the air. Yeah, I'll probably fly this plane as, as long as the plane and me can last. So I just love it. And to me, there's no greater thing than, 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 than to help save the earth, or at least take a look at where we have. Yeah, it's great to be part of the effort to uh, see what's going on with the planet, to, to fly with the people that are actually doing the work to try to save the earth. And our little part of it, getting up and seeing the big picture and hearing them explain it makes all the effort worthwhile and I'll do it as, as long as Lighthawk will let me. <laughs>